Our scripture reading this morning is 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. I'll give you a second if you'd like to turn to that. 1 John 3, verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Let's bow our heads this morning before we begin. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the surety of your word, for providing us with the information that we need to know and for setting an example for us. Lord, be with us this morning as we open your word, as we study you. Help us, Lord, to gain a blessing. In your name we pray, amen. I don't know if you can relate, but, but you know, as I was growing up, in a small town in Kentucky, in a very small church community, a place called Pee Wee Valley, Kentucky. If that doesn't say small, I don't know what does. But I remember from time to time hearing my parents, those within the church, my grandparents, uh, many of the authority figures that I knew as a child, say things like, you know, the world has certainly become a wicked place. Anybody else have that experience? Am I the only one? Now, now for me, my earliest recollections would put that at about 55, 56 years ago. That's kind of scary, really. Um, that's a long time ago. And of course, at that time as a young boy, I, I really didn't have an understanding of the scope of the condition of the world at that time, how bad things were, okay? Because growing up in a Christian family, my parents were wise enough to shelter me from a lot of that, as they should, okay? We should not be exposing our children to everything that's going on in the world. That, that's, well... We've seen the results here lately of what happens when you allow that to happen. But my elders knew far more about what I, than what I did about the condition of the world. And, and like most Adventist children, this protection that was afforded me gave me the opportunity to develop some good thought processes. It gave me the opportunity to solidify my belief system a little bit. I didn't have all this stuff out here on the fringes that were impacting me. Now, that's not to say that I wasn't a typical child and I didn't get into mischief. We're not going to talk about that this morning, though. I don't think I've even shared that with Tanya. So, anyway. But growing up in the church, I had the opportunity to meet a number of individuals who had remarkable Christian character. Teachers, pastors, lay people, conference in, uh, officials, remarkable Christian character. And unfortunately, growing up within a Christian community, I had the opportunity to meet a number of, for lack of a better term, Christian characters. Individuals for whom the name Christian seemed to be more of a marketing ploy than a doctrinal position. Now, as I'm gr growing a little older, and I've already said that I remember back 55, I'm not going to tell you how old I was, not that you care, but I'm finding more and more that what I read in Scripture represents what we should interpret as the truth, that we should not be relying on what we see around us to define truth for us. I'm particularly interested in those words that are written in red. And it's more and more obvious as I go along that what we are seeing in the world today is in no way compatible with Christianity. I hope I'm not telling you anything new this morning. 
in this regard. But since I've talked about my childhood a little bit, I want to just say also that it is important that we not allow ourselves or our children to be misled by what is going on in the world today. It is important that we are clear with our children, with our church members, about what is happening in the world. We need to stand on principle. We need to be able to define what truth is through scripture. And we need to be able to say that something is sinful and help our children and our church members to understand that what we speak is true and from scripture. You know, I heard a number of years ago that um, in training bank tellers how to recognize counterfeit, they, they do just simply one thing. And you all, many of you have heard this, right? They, they, they don't put counterfeit money in their hands. They put the real thing in their hands. So we owe it to our church members, we owe it to ourselves, we owe it to our children to be able to show each other and our families and the world in general what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be Christ-like. Because everything else that we do, everything else that is given us in Scripture, everything else that is provided to us is built upon this one basic principle. We have to be on this road. We have to be moving toward a Christ-like life or the rest of it just sounds like white noise because people aren't gonna look at what is in here. They're gonna look at the example that we give them. You can say whatever you want. Show me you're living this life. So this morning I, I chose as my subject um, being like Christ. Now this is no easy task in the year 2021. But if we're to live with Christ eternally, if we're to be like Christ, we need to have Christ's character. 1 John 2.6 says it this way, he that abideth in, abideth in him ought himself also to walk, even as he walked. We must walk the walk. And it's unfortunate that many Christians today see Christianity as a means to an end, rather than as a divine calling to be Christ-like. People say things like, I'm a Christian because I want to go to heaven. Now, there's nothing wrong with wanting to go to heaven, but we cannot make the goal of the Christian life the entering of the pearly gates. We should be Christians because we know Christ. We believe in him. We see the beauty of his character and we want to emulate that character in our own lives. What does this look like in 2021? How do we display the character of Christ to the world in the midst of the moral, secular, and ethical decay we see happening around us? When truth is relative, and wrong is being legislated to be right. Everything's getting twisted to the point that it's possible to offend everyone at once without saying anything. When I attended Southern Adventist University, I had a statistics professor who told us the first day of class, he said, if you torture the data long enough, it will confess. This is happening with the truth right now. If you twist just enough, and it doesn't have to be much, you can just add enough logic, and then soon you have a lie that's plausible, believable. Biblical principle and example are being tossed aside to make room for a touchy, feely, let's satisfy everyone kind of theology. A no need to get better or advance to sanctification kind of a theology. No need to be like Christ. We're good enough. I had a, a conversation with a member of the Adventist church not long ago. 
And he shared with me that he was tired of people pointing out that we're sinners, that we're wretched, poor, blind, and naked. He said, you know, I'm actually in pretty good shape. They were pretty satisfied with their condition. Apparently, it's easy to hear the truth, to understand the truth, and yet still believe that it, it doesn't apply to you. From the Bible Echo, December 1, 1892, Ellen White says, the closer you come to Jesus, the more faulty you will appear in your own eyes. For your vision will be clearer and your imperfections will be seen in distinct contract with his perfect character. Now for some that can be discouraging. The closer I get to Christ, the worse I'm going to feel about myself. Be not discouraged. This is an evidence that Satan's delusions are losing their power, that the vivifying influence of the Spirit of God is arousing you and that your indifference and ignorance are passing away. We're familiar with a quote found in Christ Object Lessons, page 67. Christ is seeking to reproduce in the hearts of men, and he does this through those who believe in him. The object of the Christian life is fruit bearing, the reproduction of Christ's character in the believer, that it may be reproduced in others. And on page 69, a quote again we're familiar with, when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. Unfortunately, we like titles. Sometimes we take titles because they're convenient. And some people take the name Christian because it's convenient. But just because you're a Christian, does, call yourself a Christian, doesn't mean you are a Christian. Being a Christian is more than a title. Being a Christian requires serious commitment and true surrender. A mere profession is meaningless without action. Christ stated clearly in Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. So let's define Christianity. If we're going to be Christians, we must be like Christ. This means we will do the things that Christ did ministering to the needs of others, sharing the gospel, interceding on the behalf of others, and yes, a very, very active prayer life. Prayer not just for our own needs, but for the salvation of others. When was the last time we spent a night on our knees praying for a friend? Christians, should be the most loving and caring people in the world. And that love should be manifest in how we treat and value the lives and the salvation of others. Even if it means sharing unpopular biblical truths in love to those who need to hear it. How many of us have family members who have walked away from the truth. We need to go to them in love. And we need to keep going to them in love. Our scripture reading this morning, 1 John 3, 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. When he shall appear, What? We shall be like him. The Bible is full of calls to personal decision, personal change, personal moral growth. When is it to occur? Our body will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. When Christ returns, we will receive new bodies. The dead in Christ will rise. But that's the body. That is what in the composition of man is the dust, the material part. 
the chemicals, the minerals, the physical structure. The character will be formed here and now, and when Jesus comes, it will be what it is. Remember, before Jesus comes, we undergo a sealing, a settling into the truth, before, both intellectually and spiritually, so that we cannot be moved. Again, when? Before Jesus comes. When Jesus comes, we will be like him. We will either be like Christ or we will not. That teaching of the Bible says enormous things about what a sound theology, a sound view of God and of his plan of redemption will be. It says volumes about what salvation must mean. What you believe about God affects how you live. Always. Not just Saturday morning. Your theology, your understanding of the word about God impacts how you behave. Always. Everyone seems agreed on their wanting to be saved, but over the years, few have actually weighed out with care what a belief in a need of salvation implies. Many have been content to consider Christianity to be just a taxi ride to heaven's gate on Jesus' tab. But the Bible proposes something different. It says that when Jesus comes, we will have already become like him in character. Hebrews 9, 27 offers, it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. The judgment in Greek is the krisis, the word from which we get the word crisis. Whether we're alive and remain until Jesus comes or whether we die before then, there comes a point of closure, a time when what we are becomes settled, final. Revelation 22, 11 says that a time arrives before Jesus' second coming when he who is unjust will for the remainder of his existence past that time remain unjust. When he was filthy will remain filthy. When he was righteous will remain righteous. And when he is, who is holy, when that time comes for the remainder of his existence shall remain holy. Amen. We are heading straight for the judgment. Make no mistake. The crisis the crisis, the close of probation, the second coming. When Jesus appears and those who have learned to, as Revelation 14, 4 says, follow the lamb wherever he goes, we'll be like him. Amen. How do we get there? Not by our own strength. It is entirely by following Jesus, entirely by copying him in God's strength entirely by, in this life, letting him make us not merely less sinful, but Christ-like altogether. You know, of course, what this biblical experience is called. Revelation 7, 1 to 3. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, and the, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree, and I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. Yes, the sealing. Sister White puts it this way, the sealing is a settling into the truth both intellectually and spiritually, so that we cannot be moved. When does this happen? When we're alive. Amen. Settling into is an enlightening phase, for it tips us off that the fact that this ceiling is a process. It is a process of character development, a process of personal change a process of entire transformation, of realignment from one kingdom to
to another. To facilitate the sealing, there's a change that must happen. Genesis 3.15 says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. At the fall, the enemy's status between us and Satan was changed. A new alliance was formed between the devil and the race of humans. The kingdom of selfishness gained some advocates. But God promised he would intervene. He would change his people. But this is no passive thing. Philippians 2, 12 and 13 says, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. This working out of our salvation is a cooperation. God does his part and we do our part. And while we're all too willing to be saved, some run for cover when they hear about the cooperative aspect of the plan of salvation. But they're running from that which the Bible shows is their personal responsibility. If you're concerned about this working out of our salvation, consider, consider Revelation 22:12. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. We have a work to do. Ellen White discusses this change that has to occur in great controversy. Page 506, God declares, I will put enmity. This enmity is not naturally entertained. When man transgressed the divine law, his nature became evil, and he was in harmony and not at variance with Satan. There exists naturally no enmity between sinful man and the originator of sin. Both became evil through apostasy. It is the grace that Christ implants in the soul which creates in man enmity against Satan. Without his converting grace and renewing power, man would continue the captive of Satan, a servant ever ready to do his bidding. But the new principle in the soul creates conflict where hitherto had been peace. The power which Christ imparts enables man to resist the tyrant and usurper. Whoever is seen to abhor sin instead of loving it, whoever resists and conquers those passions that that have held sway, displays the operation of a principle wholly from above. Whoever sees the repulsive character of sin and in strength from above resists temptation will assuredly arouse the wrath of Satan and his subjects. We are at war. When we talk about wanting to be like Christ, we are not just looking at the far end of eternity, the after the second coming end of eternity. We're talking about the kind of character we want to have for all eternity. We're talking about the kind of behavior we want to experience for all eternity. We're talking about the kind of behavior we ourselves will exhibit for all eternity. In fact, when we say we want to be like Christ, we really are talking about the kind of behavior we need and must model here and now. A behavior that we will continue for all eternity. We have to ask ourselves then, what is the claim I am making? And am I making it convincingly as a Christian today? Because if I support God's plan to govern the universe for all eternity, and that I am committed to being like Christ, then I am saying that I am committed to heaven, doing something to me here and now to God changing my basic moral alignment. I am saying that I want my life here and now to be a window into a different kind of world. In short, you cannot say that you really want to be saved. You cannot say that you wish to be Christ-like, that you want to become unselfish and loving and spirit-filled and stay that way forever and then live in the here and now without reference to that. 
You cannot just offload the implications to some vague time in the far future. You have to live today very much as if you plan to live in eternity future. Not only is it well to get used to that li living now, so it's less difficult to transition, transition to the kingdom one day, but of yet greater moment is how your personal life affects the credibility of the message that you send to others as a Christian in 2021. You know, you have to admire people who back up what they believe by their actions. You have to admire our missionaries, and we have a couple, who are willing to leave the comforts that we enjoy in the United States, travel across the world to a hot, miserable climate to share Christ with others. I, I love it when people back up what they say. I, I love it when somebody says what they mean and they mean what they say. But you know, suicide bombers back up what they believe with what they say and what they do. And they don't have the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, they have very little good. How much more impetus can there be on us to recognize where we stand as Christians and what we believe and use that in a way that brings honor and glory to God. Our profession, our claim must become our reality. So sometimes, you know, we, we, we're caught because we hear a message like this and we say, oh, that sounds good. I'll, I'll get to that. I'll, I'll get to that someday. But I, right now I'm kind of caught between what I want to do, okay, and the things that I, I know I'm supposed to do. I feel like Frank Sinatra. I want to do it my way. The problem is we know, right? It'd be different if we didn't know. We're accountable for what we know, but we know. And so here we are and we find ourselves in a position where we know the truth. We know what we're supposed to do. We know what's required of us. So we have to ask the question, why, why is it that we're not doing it? Something has to change. Our desires have to change. We must pray and ask God to change our desires, to lead us to desire, to desire to be willing. Yes, I, I said that right. We should ask God to change what we want. David prayed in Psalms 51.10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. We can choose to do this. We can choose to ask God to make us willing to be made willing, and he will work in us to bring us to that. As our desires are changed, our life will change. What we are will be changed. We will be moving from the kingdom where all our habits were formed toward God's house. We need something that only God can give us. No education or methodology or training can, without God's empowerment, do anything lasting for us. And if you're reading a spirit-filled this or a, you know, a, a life filled with that from, from all these authors that are out there, I encourage you to put those books down. Pick up this book. Pick up the spirit of prophecy. We've got no excuse. And the time for making excuses is over. The key to the whole problem is simple. He, Jesus, must increase and I must decrease. The kingdom we have grown used to and all its excuses for lingering just a bit longer, continuing just a little longer, to make choices to sin those supposedly small, minor sins, those days have expired. Now Jesus must increase. His unselfish kingdom must increase. 
We are Christ's evidence to the universe that God is right. Are we a good witness? God has something better for us. You know, we face a unique challenge. Um, we were talking earlier about when I was, when I was uh, younger, and, and I'm sure a number of you will relate to this. I remember when I was younger, if you wanted to find something in the spirit of prophecy, how, how did you find it? You grabbed a book, and you started flipping through that book. You know... It's funny, a thought just occurred to me when I, was, when I was young, something Tanya and I were talking about in the car when I was, when I was young, my dad had a station wagon because there were seven of us in the family. Way too many kids. Um, I thought, I was the second oldest, so two would have been enough. But, but in that vehicle, um, we had an eight-track tape player, okay? Everybody, not everybody, most people remember eight-track tape players, okay? So you listen to a song, a favorite song would come around on the eight-track tape player, right? Okay? You wanted to hear that song again. What, what, what did you have to do? You generally had to wait for it to come around again. I, I remember sitting in the car after it was parked in the, in the garage, um, asking Dad, can you leave the keys in? I want to hear that song again. And you had to listen to five, six, seven, eight other songs till you got to the song. We've become far too impatient. Now, we're not alone in this. We're not alone in this, okay? Christians aren't the only people that's impatient. In our, in our little town in Shelbyville, every store that sells food has a drive through window. Every one. You want a bag of peanuts on the way to work? You pull up, you get in line, hand somebody your money. You, you, there's no stopping the car, getting out. We, we can't wait for anything. So nowadays when we want to find something from, from Ellen White or something in Scripture, instead of picking a book up and studying and reading and finding it, what do we do? We grab this right here and we do a quick search and there it is. You know, and it doesn't take any time to find what we're talking about. It's not requiring us to do any study at all. We become an instant generation, and that's that's a problem. The Bible says, "Study to show thyself approved," not Google to show thyself approved. Let's get back into the Word. Let's let's get the books out. Let's do some reading. Let's do some soul, ser soul searching. So what is keeping me from being like Christ? This is a question that we each need to answer. Whatever it is, a snippy attitude, a controlling spirit, a desire to be first, self-reliance, some hidden sin. Let's confess these things uh, and lay these things aside and put Christ back on the throne where he belongs. Let's not make this complicated. It, it's not. It was never intended to be complicated. We got all these books now. Books that are trying to show you little nuances, little changes, little... Get into the Word. Now notice I didn't say it was not going to be difficult. Anytime that you surrender, it's going to be difficult. You can see that if you've gotten married, you know that when you're married, you don't always get your way. There's a certain, except I do, sorry, except I do. We all have to surrender to an extent. And with God, the surrender needs to be a complete surrender. We all have bad habits that, well, we've developed and nurtured over a long period of time. And it's only with the power of Christ that we can overcome. Amen. We will struggle. But we must claim the promise found in James 1, 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Christ has promised the crown. 
But make no mistake, the crown is far less important than meeting the one who presents it. I want this kind of life. Is there anyone else this morning that wants this kind of life? My prayer this morning is that we will be willing to take, undertake a little self-evaluation with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Let God show you what it is that you need to change and then follow his leading. This is a, this is a moral imperative. I will pray for you and I ask that you pray for me. Amen, right? Please stand and join me as we close. Hymn number 311, I Would Be Like Jesus. Heavenly Father, as we leave this place, go throughout this coming week, Lord, help us to remember what you have done for us. Help us not to focus on the things of this world, but to focus on you and your plan for us. Help us to be faithful. Help us to follow you wherever you go. In your name we pray. Amen.